be with us today. Warm welcome and really thank you for being with us. Some people were unfortunately not able to make it, but we're very happy to be able to Zoom this uh, proceedings to people who are far away. So welcome to you whether you're in the flesh or virtually with us. We are here to um, mourn the passing of uh, Donald John McLeod, um, but also to celebrate a long and fruitful life. Um, the very last conversation that I had with my father about uh, a day or so before he passed away on the telephone, he said to me, by the way, I just want to know, what is a student fellow? I said, why do I know what a student fellow is? No, I'm singing this song in my head that we um, learned as children on the way to Bangor. And uh, it talks about student fellow. And I want to know, what is a student fellow? And uh, this is just gives an indication of a person who actually was fascinated by the world right up to the very end. Um, and it is in this spirit that we um, have asked various people to play tribute to a person's life who was very varied and who touched people in, in, in many different ways. So thank you to all the people who have agreed to speak for a few minutes about uh, Donald. Um, and uh, we know that each of you speak on behalf of um, the others who are close to you. The first person is um, Angus McLeod, um, his younger brother, um, with whom he played a lot when he was a child, and they remained very good friends during adulthood. So, over to Angus. Thank you, Shalai. Thank you. In really in normal circumstances, I would hand a task like that over to my brother. <laughs> um, he's, a, he's always been a far better speaker than I have. And uh, just to give you an example, we, when we were at a farm school, the headmistress was a very uh, what would you say? Very tough sort of a lady. And uh, we stayed with them, uh, our parents having been off on a mission which we, for which we got uh, sent over there. And uh, one of these mornings when we were having breakfast with the rest of the school company, uh, somebody said, uh, uh, the lady who was the, the headmistress and the uh, lady in charge of the whole, the whole uh, arrangement said that she came past and Don was sitting there and she said, uh, Donald, why haven't you eaten your porridge? And instead of sort of cowering as everybody had expected, uh, Don came back with a remark. Because it's nasty. <laughs> so he, he was the sort of person you always got to say whatever you wanted said <laughs> instead of having asking you to do it. <laughs> so I have many uh, years of experience with Don, and come to think of it, I'm about 28 years more uh, known to Don than I am to his own family. So uh, I could always come up with a better story than they had about God. <laughs> I'm not going to talk any of the part of the, uh, the association we had, but uh, it is uh, sad to see the end of Don, but I, I would say we have so much to be thankful for, but uh, he uh, lasted as long as he did and uh, wish him well and that's all that I have to say. And, uh, I know that the two of you uh, 
had a very, very special bond for, for, for many years. And as you say, you have known him longer than any of us. So thank you very much for that tribute. Um, the next is, is Jean uh, Rogers. In a cunning move, I delegated to my brother. Okay, good, good. That's, I like that. Right, now it's now Fergus, so, who is the uh, son of the other sibling, Ken McLeod, who uh, has also unfortunately passed away. Over to you, Fergus. Yes, so contrary to the program, I'm not Jean Rogers. Mm -hmm. I'm Fergus McLeod. Ken, my dad, was, was Donald's mm -hmm. elder brother. And uh, uh, my sister Jean, my wife Christine and I are representing our branch of the clan today. Uh, and that branch also includes uh, my brother Kim and my sister Sheila. Um, and Kim has some, some specific memories of, of Don and Pat from the 70s. And he says, I arrived at Don and Pat's house in Richards Bay in 1976 as a young public prosecutor, or as he put it, persecutor. With all my worldly goods and my VW Beetle to stay a night or two whilst finding more permanent accommodation, I rang the bell and noticed a sign stating, too much of a good thing is wonderful. I was soon to discover what this meant. Pat gave me a warm welcome and helped me find accommodation. During the months and weeks that followed, I often popped in with a carry pack of beers to enjoy unparalleled hospitality and being invited to walks along the beach, shoeing of horses, and treatment generally reserved for immediate, immediate family members. Yeah. I came to know Don as someone who was intelligent, disciplined, determined, and wildly, widely read, but also kind and generous with a sense of humor bar none. Kim also remembered some escapades, some of them dating back to probably before the rest of us were around. And this one must come from the 50s. Uh, Donald was painting the bathroom at 65 Howick Road his parents' house in Peter Maritzburg, with a spray gun until overcome by fumes. He had to be rescued and placed on the lawn outside to regain consciousness. One of his dogs was taken by a crocodile while Don was golfing in Richards Bay. He returned to the scene of the crime with a hunting rifle added discreetly to his golf bag. The next installment of that story has not been recorded, which is probably just as well. And then the, the brown vitamin tablets which Don pretended to remove from a dog and then explained to Fiona, to Fiona that it was an edible one popped into his mouth. Apparently Fiona was sick on the spot. <laughs> Some of Jean's recollections. Every time I interacted with Don, I knew that I was going to spend at least some time laughing. He had a wicked and very clever sense of humor and was always quick to come up with dry and insightful comments which had us chuckling, chuckling heartily. It was never dull chatting to Don. One often, however, also had quite serious conversations with him because he was curious about the world around him and fascinated by how things worked. He would give detailed and incredibly interesting explanations of processes and concepts. He was able to understand and remember so much, a lifelong learner who was hungry for knowledge and enjoyed spending time doing research into topics. A phenomenal brain for retaining facts and figures, he also had a critical mind and was able to assess issues with insight. Don had a great sense of fun and enjoyed an adventure. He was never too old to do things that most adults would shun, such as sliding down a slide or playing wild games with the kids. We all remember having spaghetti races at the dining table when visiting, when we saw who could suck up a long piece of spaghetti the fastest. He was always keen to take on challenges, even into his later years, such as taking a bicycle riding and going on the big swing at Moses and Bieber Stadium. It was never a dull moment in the Don McLeod household when they weren't playing polo cross, working with their pointers, or rescuing a horse which had fallen into the swimming pool. Don was spinning yards about edible ticks. The edible tick story obviously made a big impression on all of us. He also had a patent recipe for curing flu which involved eating large quantities of garlic and drinking rum. One benefit of this remedy was that no one could get close enough to him to catch his germs. <laughs> Some of my own memories, uh, Don and Pat arriving at our small mine house in northern Rhodesia with the whole family. Don and Ken managed to remain serenely aloof from the chaos in that cramped space. They had earnest discussions about manly issues and drank beer. <laughs> Later, when Don, Angus and uh, Ken all lived with their respective families in and around Joburg, 
It became a regular practice for the families to congregate on a Sunday evening at one of the houses, and these often turned into festive occasions. He was a man of many talents, shifting seamlessly from running chemical plants to farming, switching efficiently from hunting to golf and cycling. As kids, we marveled at Don's waxed moustache, the tips of which were visible from behind him. No matter the time of day, Don could be seen with a beer in hand, and wherever he went, there were dogs. One thing I recall is when, when Don used to lift his head slightly, adopt a slightly far away look in his eyes, and stroke his moustache, he knew that an amusing anecdote or a hilarious joke was not far away. We've seen Don rarely in recent years, but it has been a comfort just to know that he was around. We're all going to miss him. They were next door neighbors when they were children. And then in 1984, they decided they'd just become neighbors again uh, on the Nowhere Farm in Dargo. So, Bell, over to you. <coughs> I'd like to thank the McLeod clan for asking a Munro to say a word about a McLeod. But I promise you, McLeod, I'll be very polite. <laughs> My first memory of Don is a bit vague as I was only three. Um, they lived in this rambling house next door through a bamboo fence. Well, it wasn't a fence, it was a head had a little gap, and his oldest sister was getting married, and it was during the Second World War, to a British naval officer. And Mrs. McLeod, Ida, who originally came from Northern Natal, I must say about her, Don's mother, she could only speak Zulu, <laughs> and had to be taught in later life to speak English. Anyway, that's why Don could speak to me so well. Anyway, we went, and we were the flower girls. And I remember my first sight of Don was in this tall, lanky teenager. I came up to about his knees, and um, I was terrified of him. And I thought, I never want to see this man again. He's so big. Anyway, the years passed, and um, he went off to uh, university, and we all moved off. And then, as Katrina said, 40 years later, we decided to live in the Dargo, Pete and I, and we were driving down this rather unfortunate road. Uh, it was a little bit rocky, not to say the worst. We managed to get there, and we saw on a gate below us a name that said, Nowhere. And I said to Pete, this man must have a very subtle sense of humor. <laughs> anyway, we later found out our neighbors were Don and Pat McLeod, and we became great friends. And we used to sit around their lovely log fire in the evening, and he would relate all his escapades of hunting, which of course changed a lot into field trials and something more timid. But it was a great honor to live with him, well not live with them, but near them. And they used to take us on holidays. Unfortunately, he was always insist on being the driver. And he drove terribly fast. And, and while he drove, he used to quote Omar Khayyam, from the beginning to the very end. I almost know it off by heart myself. <laughs> and then I must just quickly say, in the Dargo, he became a very well-known figure, as he was very um, constructive during our travels in the commandos and used to organize the nightly patrols which he used to collect Pete and off they'd go. I don't know quite what they did, but anyway, yeah. it was a patrol. And then, of course, they were wonder he was a wonderful um, tennis player and a member of the, uh, a parishioner of the church. And in his latter days, 
he joined the Birmingham Club. And even at the age of 90, I must say where the Jack was, we did have, he had very limited eyesight. We had somebody with their little white hanky wagging it to show him where the ball was. And he used to bowl amazingly well. And I think my last memory, or my memory of, of Don, will be in the early morning with the mists in the cold winter, I would see Don and Pat walking up the slopes of the hills with their dogs racing before them. And that reminded me of his very Scottish Heritage. Thank you. That was lovely, and I, I, I do remember you and Pete coming over, and lots of lovely, lovely social times, and lots of lovely uh, talks. Um, so next up is, is Fergus Snow, one of the um, grandchildren. Uh, he's done a tribute, and I think he is speaking on behalf of all of the grandchildren. Well, what to say? It's hard to put everything in what we would like to say. A fellow got his name when we were very young. He used to call his dog a damn fine fellow when he was good. I mean the dog, not fellow. <laughs> Byron thought that his grandfather was then a damn fine fellow, and with that, fellow was named. As grandchildren, we had varied experiences and memories with fellow. There would be memories of fellow's babysitting skills, him setting, sending us up the hill one kilometer on the farm to check who was coming in or going out for Katrina and John's wedding, age nine down to two at that point. With rack pack rations and military rank, we went to babysit ourselves with glee. <laughs> Sheena the general, down to me the lowly private. <laughs> Fellow and granny made efforts to always be active and fit. And with this it translated to walks together along nowhere roads between uh, their house and Val and Peter and back and along the beach to the pub. This fellow always liked to stop for a halfway pint. Fellow also took to beach cricket in the Westbrook Garden at one stage. Then there was Fellow's dislike for water, which led to dog collars and leashes around grandkids' waists while they swam for easy extraction if necessary without needing to get himself wet. <laughs> As a famous wart mort merchant, Fellow was always ready to make a deal. If we had any warts, he would negotiate to buy them off of us and sell them to the local warthogs. <laughs> Fellow believed in us all and was very proud of us all. An example of that was within the last year, he had an advanced theory on dark energy and the physics behind it. With a sight and issue, he called Aiden to get some help with the theory. He never doubted Aiden's knowledge and believed he could help him with this theory. Aidan said, however, he wasn't sure about whether he helped or not. I can without a doubt say that Fellow was an incredible role model to us all. He was able to chat to us about our interests. He had immense knowledge, wit, and a love of a clever joke, poem, or an amusing song. He, however, had very few modern songs that he liked, or any music. He despised music attached to adverts and documentaries, describing it as pinka ponka pinka ponk racket. <laughs> and with that, there were earmuffs near his chair and a very worn mute button to combat this. <laughs> we would all be able to think of some poem, song, or story that he had shared with us, and uh, all stored in his infinite memory box, which he had. And one of his favorite poems was The Quangle Wangle's Hat by Edward Lear. And it goes, On top of the crumped tree, the quangle wangle sat, but his face you could not see on account of his beaver hat. 
for his hat was a hundred and two feet wide, with ribbons and bibbons on every side, and bells and buttons and loops and lace, so that nobody ever could see the face of the Quangle Wangle Queen. The Quangle Wangle said to himself on the crumpy tree, Jam and jelly and bread are the best of food for me, but the longer I live on this crumpy tree, the plainer than ever it seems to me that very few people come this way, and life on the whole is far from gay, said the Quangle Wangle Queen. But there came to the crumpy tree Mr. and Mrs. Canary, and they said, Did you ever see a spot so charmingly airy? May we build a nest in your lovely hat? Mr. Quangle Wangle, grant us that. Oh, please let us come and build a nest of whatever material suits you best, Mr. Quangle Wangle Quee. And besides, to the crumpty tree came the stork, the duck, and the owl, the snail and the bumblebee, the frog and the fumble fowl, the fumble fowl with the corkscrew leg, and all of them said, We humbly beg, we may build our homes on your lovely hat. Mr. Quangle Wangle, grant us that. Mr. Quangle Wangle Quee. And the golden grass came there, and the pobble who has no toes, and the small Olympian bear, and the dong with the luminous nose, and the blue baboon who played the flute, and the orient calf from the land of Toot, and the attery squash and the bisky bat, all came and built on the lovely hat of the Quangle Wangle Quee. And the Quangle Wangle said to himself on the crumpty tree, When all these creatures move, what a wonderful noise they'll be. And, the night, and at the night, by the light of the mulberry moon, they danced to the flute of the blue baboon on the broad green leaves of the crumpty tree, and all were as happy as happy could be with the Quangle Wangle Queen. Fellow learned this poem as a child, and I think it rang true to him personally, as he was happier with his family and friends around him, even if that meant taking a folding chair halfway up the driveway when loud grandchildren had been a bit too much. <laughs> he was a bit like Quangle Wangle Queen, although his version of a hat was his moustache, which stretched 102 feet from side to side. So then, Bellows Tribute, we will close with the poem. Fellow, the man of greatest honor and more, the man that all adore, the horse rider, golfer, farmer, dancer, hot air balloon rider, zip line slider, stadium swinger, the man behind the legend, the story behind the name, the kindness behind the face, the heart behind the family, the silent soul that cared. The greatest intelligence that always taught, the man who shared poems and songs at ease, the man of humor and a witty joke, the man of example and integrity, the man whose moustache was of legend, the partner to his other half, the, fa the father to a spectacular lot, and the grandfather we called fellow, the don, the damn finest fellow. Time to reunite with the soulmate has come. Good bye now that you remain with me.
Petrus Aden, uh, one of the grandsons. Um, I just want to uh, quickly, before we move on to the next tribute, just read something from the Duma family. Um, the Dumas worked uh, for Don McLeod and Pat McLeod for many years, from 1986, including uh, Duma himself, Lucy, Catherine, Agnes, and Julia. Um, so the family has been part of our family for a long time. Um, and this is their, their message from the Duma family. Please accept our deepest condolences for your family's loss. We sincerely hope peace finds you during this difficult time. No grief is greater than the departure of such a kind man as him. He has accomplished many good things in life. May his soul rest in peace. Thank you very much for that. Um, okay, so uh, Duncan, our brother, will do the talking on our behalf. He's the bravest, I think, of us. And so, would have been included in the so-called silent generation. That generation that followed the, second, the greatest generation that fought the Second World War. The silent generation that worked with and within the system, that did not wave posters or placards, and did not issue manifestos, and did not make speeches. The generation that in their formative years knew shortage and worked hard, lived frugally and stoically. Dad lived through the Great Depression, the rise and fall of fascism, social nationalism and communism, the Second World War, the Cold War, the space race, the fall of the Berlin Wall, decolonization and globalization. He experienced more technical and scientific advances than there had been in all preceding history and, wish, and, and witnessed many significant and meaningful cultural and social transformations throughout his life. He experienced firsthand the, the effects of devastating childhood diseases, including tetanus, which he himself contracted as a child and thankfully survived, and of course leukemia. He lived in the Union of South Africa in the ages of Louis Guetta and Jan Smuts, of D.F. Milan, of H.S. Wood, of P.W. Guetta, of F.W. De Clare and Nelson Mandela. He also experienced unsupervised play, Angus, mm. way before such term ever existed. Race cars down Town Hill on his bicycle, way before bicycle helmets or disc brakes existed. Drove at 80 miles per hour before the existence of highways and toll roads or even safety belts. Climbed around in boilers well before the invention of health and safety rules. Drank tap water, smoked far too much, maintained the gold standard beer drinking capacity into old age, didn't use sunscreen much, shot charging elephants, and stalked wounded buffalo, and apparently spray painted insides of rooms without a mask. <laughs> and lived to 93. An unknown author has suggested that man is a success who has lived well, laughed often, and loved much. Has gained the respect of intelligent men and the love of children has filled his mission completely his task, who leaves, who leaves the world a better place than he found it, who have never lacked appreciation of Earth's beauty and gave his best. Did Dad live well? I'd like to think so. 
not in the sense of lavish or luxurious or extravagant, but fully, completely, and generously. GM of record-breaking artificial bird turd manufacturing facility, farmer, lieutenant colonel, mathematician, and not only in his line of work, but also for front of figure. Historian, enthusiastic traveler and explorer, fisherman, horseman, big game hunter, bridge player, tennis player, field stylist, and dog lover. Pointers, of course, but there were also a bull bull look-alike, a basset hound, a border collie, and two spaniels, including, of course, the world-famous gorgeous Heidi. Father, husband, grandfather, friend, all tackled with gusto and dedication. Admittedly, gardening, nappy changing, swimming was not so big. But perhaps that is part of, of being measured as having lived a good life and of living well. Did he laugh often and love much? Indeed. Though not much given to PDAs, public displays of affection, Dad very really definitely loved and cared deeply. I can attest to this. As I suggest, can all hear today. For me, his obituary to Mom, borrowed from Mark Twain, perhaps demonstrates this best. Where she was, was Eden. Came in respect of intelligent men, undoubtedly. <clears throat> this is one I dare not, this is one I dare not pretend to confirm myself. But there certainly are many here who are counted amongst the wise and scholarly. And that can, I'm sure, bear witness to more than a passing appreciation of Don's intellect. There are also some here, and I do count myself amongst these, on whom I fear his intellect was wasted. <laughs> Woe was he or she, caught in post-dinner discussion, colored conjecture, Rainey's hypothesis, continental drift, the nature of ethnic of ethic di um, dilemmas, Lord Kitchener, Garbillo Princip, Bosnia and many, many other varied topics. And although engaging, congenial, and never boring, and in part, admittedly, because of the copious amounts of compulsory lubrication provided during such late discussions, and always annoyingly accurate and well-informed on his behalf when fact-checked the next morning, Gaining the love of children. Certainly, when we were young enough to be classed as children, we, immediate, uh, we, the immediate offspring, certainly loved him. But it is perhaps his grandchildren who are best placed here. And although I can confirm that his early engagements, his first and perhaps even later grandchildren, was distinctly akin to that of panicky stranger meets grubby puppy likely to explode on him at any moment. It is perhaps these grandchildren, these very same grandchildren, who can best attest here. Leaves the world a better place than he found it? Undoubtedly. At very least, a contribution to South Africa's economic development and national prosperity, a conversion from an agrarian resource, resource um, extraction economy to an, at least in part, industrialized mass production economy cannot be overemphasized. The transformation relied heavily on that hard-working silent generation and its engineers like that. To suggest perhaps that never in the field of human endeavor and so on may be overstating it somewhat. But yes, that definitely leaves the world better than he found it. He who never lacked appreciation of Earth's beauty. Undeniably, Dad, as many would know, was never a great fan of gardening. But he did point out that this should not be confused with a lack of appreciation of gardens. <coughs> Similarly, though never gusty about Earth's beauty, 
He spent as much of his spare time as he could outdoors in nature. For Dad, going fishing was not always, in fact perhaps seldom, about the fish. Dad did give his best to all he did and to all. So, to live in the hearts we leave behind is not to die. This given, I suggest, Dad would say, do not stand at my grave and cry, but see to it that I do not die. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you, Sally. We're going to give the last word to Donald. Um, this is a recording done by Janet when they went to the Wild Coast. And, um, you know, as uh, Fergus said, he had the most amazing memory. Um, for all sorts of things. So this was one of the songs that he used to sing to us. So here he is. Lights, sound, action. <laughs> I'm now going to sing you, for your delectation, a song which we sang many years ago in our old cars that had no radio when our children were small. Oh, the sons of the prophets are brave men and fair and quite unaccustomed to fear. But the bravest by far in the ranks of the Shah was Abdul the Bulbul Emir. And the heroes are many and well known to fame in the ranks that are led by the Tsar. And the bravest by far was a man by the name of Ivan. Skibinski Skabar. One day this bold Russian he shouldered his gun and he drummed his most truculent sneer. To town he did go where he trod on the toe of Abdul the Bulbul Amir. Said Ivan, my friend, oh, no, I got that wrong there. Young man said Abdul. Has life grown so dull that you wish to end your career? A vile infidel, no, you have trod on the toe of Abdul the Bulbul Amir. Said Ivan, my friend, your remarks in the end will avail you but little, I fear, for you'll never survive to repeat them alive. Mr. Uh, Abdul the Bulbul Amir. Then that brave, brave Mameluke drew his trusty skabook with a cry of Al Bar. With murderous intent, he ferociously went for Ivan Skavinsky Skabar. Oh, they fought all that night neath the pale yellow moon. The din was, it was heard from afar. Huge multitudes came, so great was the fame of Abdul and Ivan Skabar. Now, now Abdul's long knife was extracting the life. In effect, he was shouting his awe when he felt himself struck by that wily Kalmuk, Ivan Skabinsky Skabar. Now the Sultan rode up with his spectacles blue, expecting the Jip Victor to cheer. But when he drew nigh, it was to hear the last sigh of Abdul Ivan Skivinsky Skavar. Tsar Fetrovich, too, in his spectacles blue, drove up in his new crested car. He arrived just in time to exchange a last line. With Abdul the Bulbul Lemir. I've got the wrong way around there. Yeah, <laughs> now a Muscovite. <laughs> <laughs> now a monument stands where the view Danube runs, inscribed there in characters clear. O oh, stranger, when passing, 
pray for the soul of Abdul the Bull Bull I'm here and a Muscovite maiden her lone vigil keeps neath the light of the pale cola star and the name that she murmurs so oft as she weeps is Ivan Skavinsky Skavar what a sad story wasn't it now everybody's fast asleep and we can carry on driving <laughs> So, uh, we've known the McLeod since I was a little girl. When the first speaker mentioned 76, it was before that because it was in uh, Hoffa House and just happy memories of tennis in the afternoon when um, my mum played with Pat McLeod in the tennis club and playing in their big garden and swimming. And uh, of course, uh, the evenings, bridge and um, dogs and family and that just always seems to describe the McLeods. So if you'll just join me in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, the same Lord who comforted the grieving on earth and wept when Lazarus died, we pray for the extended McLeod family today. For Duncan Davy, Sheena, Roderick, for Fiona, for Janet, Tim, Byron, Fergus and Kyle, for Katrina, John, Liam, Aidan, for Angus and Ingrid. We pray for them to be comforted by each other and by our love for them. We thank you for Don's life and for the McLeod's influence on our lives. Don always seemed to know what to say. I'm always thankful that he spoke at our wedding and that he spoke at Dad's 90th birthday. He always seemed to me to be unshakable and strong. It must have been so tough for the family to see him move towards the day he died with him having been the man he was, the father, the brother, the grandfather he was. We pray, Lord, please comfort and strengthen us to cope with Don's passing. Don was such a great friend to my dad. They were going to their own world discussing history and politics and philosophy, often disagreeing a great deal on their opinions. But, that, but such was the character of Don that you didn't have to agree with him to be his friend. We, th we thank you for Don's character. To use a lesser used term nowadays, Don was a man of character. It must have been so tough for him as it was for my dad when his wife passed away. They were always such a team. Don and Pat. Pat caring and Don there to support her. Pat organized, organizing and Don being organized. And yet, he carried on caring even when the team was broken. Thank you for Don. Thank you for his courage and strength. We pray that we may be courageous and strong too, as Don was, and to keep on caring as Don did. And we thank you, Lord, for Don's somewhat towering example. And we thank you for his life and his love, his great sense of humor. We thank you for Don, Lord. Amen. Thank you very much. That uh, concludes the formal part of the uh, program. Um, thank you very much to everybody for your wonderful words. I think it's been such a lovely kind of diverse capturing of his life uh, and of the person that, that he was. So thank you very much for that. Claire is going to play the last post and um, reveal. Um, but before, so that would be the final kind of item, but before she does so, just to say please join us. We have refreshments, finger lunch at the back. There is a bar tab that you can ask waitresses to just bring you if you would like, whatever you would like to drink. So please do join us afterwards for sort of more informal discussions and, and just getting together. And um, thank you once again to all of you for being here in person or remotely. Um, it really uh, is very comforting to us to have everybody around while we remember our father. So, thank you. Claire, sorry, uh, by the way, worked with uh, Don in the last number of months. Um, and I think she was one of the people who gave him strength 
in those last months, always very positive. She was the physiotherapist, always very positive, and um, I think he looked forward to her visits on a daily basis, probably more than anything else. Thank you, Claire. Um.